Hi everyone, I'm Tony. I'm Head of Artist Relations and Marketing at Emu Bands. Emu Bands is a digital music distribution service formed in 2005. We exist to help independent artists and labels get their music onto major uh, digital platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Deezer, etc. Um, in today's video, I want to talk about content ID, monetization, and managing your recorded music copyrights. So, Firstly, what is Content ID? Content ID is a system developed by YouTube. Um, it enables rights holders to identify usages of their copyrights within videos on the YouTube platform. And Facebook have developed a, a different copyright management system to YouTube's, but it works in a similar way and it's called Facebook Rights Manager. So very similar topics for both of them that we'll cover. How does it work? Videos uploaded to YouTube are scanned against a database of files um, that have been submitted to YouTube by rights holders. Effectively, this means that if a user uploads a video to YouTube, uh, which contains a sound recording, which has been delivered to YouTube's content ID system, it will flag as a match. And depending on the monetization policy, the rights holders chosen to apply to the video, which contains our sound recordings, an action is taken by YouTube and applied to that video. A monetization policy is applied to every sound recording on the YouTube content ID system. And it's through telling YouTube um, which policy to apply for each of your sound recordings that we, as the distributor or whoever's managing your content ID system, um, we tell them what you want to happen when a video is uploaded to YouTube that contains one or more of your sound recordings. And there's three monetization policies on YouTube. The first one is block, and that basically means that the sound recording um, isn't allowed to appear in any user generated video on YouTube. So if you apply a block policy, essentially what will happen is if someone uploads a video that contains your sound recording, um, that sound recording is blocked from appearing in that video. Okay. The second one is, is called track. That second monetization policy is called track. Um, track, uh, really nothing happens to the video. So no ads are served on the video. Um, and as a result, then no, no revenue is generated as a result of that. Um, in terms of the, the user's experience, um, nothing happens, the video is playable, the, the sound recording plays in the video too. Depending on the setup that your distributor or your um, whoever's managing your content ID, um, depending on the system that they have, you might get, um, you know, reports delivered to you that will have things like, you know, how many plays a certain video's had with that sound recording, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially tracking um, as a monetization policy uh, effectively, you're, you're not taking um, an action against the person that's uploaded the video, okay? And the third policy is called monetize, and that's exactly what it sounds like. If your sound recording um, policy, your monetization policy on that sound recording is monetize, um, any videos that are uploaded to YouTube which contain that sound recording um, will have ads served over the top of them. So an ad will either play at the start or the beginning, um, or the middle of the video um, and you'll receive a portion of the revenue generated from that that advert that was placed on the video. Um, so that's a way to monetize your sound recordings on YouTube. Some exceptions apply to that. So um, we'll look at these just now. So if there's multiple rights holders making claims on one video and this results in multiple monetization policies being applied, uh, YouTube applies the most restrictive of those policies. So for example, if one rights holder wants to monetize the video, but another wants to block it, then YouTube will um, will block, uh, that will be the policy that they choose. That The block policy is more restrictive. Um, so that overrides the, the monetize policy. It's also worth bearing in mind that publishers who represent the copyright contained within the composition may also submit content ID claims for the underlying song. Um, so the same rules apply here. The most restrictive policy applies. This can mean that if you've released a cover version where you don't own the rights to the composition, um, your sound recording policy um, may be overridden by the, the publisher's policy for the composition, which is something to bear in mind. Um, some other things to bear in mind with Content ID, uh, when you're approaching Content ID, it's important to remember that it's materially different to delivering your music to a regular streaming or download platform. It's completely different. It requires ongoing management of your catalogue on those services. There may be times where, um, you know, the video on YouTube only delivers a, a partial match. So you might be asked to log in 
and review a claim. So you, it's, it's you as the rights holder that says, you know, actually, yes, that is my sound recording. I'm going to claim that. Or you say, no, actually, it's not. I'm going to release it. Um, and there's other instances where there might actually be disputes that arise um, if multiple rights holders are trying to claim the same sound recording, which sounds rare, but it does happen. For this reason, it's important to ensure that you control the exclusive rights to the sound recordings you deliver to Content ID and ensure that if you work with a record label or you work through more than one distributor, um, that you only give one of these parties the sound recording to manage on Content ID, otherwise you will get conflicts. Some distributors will notify you of any claims which come in and you're generally given a limited period of time to decide whether to confirm or release a claim. So ensure that you're contactable um, easily. It's not a sort of um, set and forget type of service. It does require you to be on the ball. Um, and because it's completely different to any other type of streaming or music service, a number of conditions apply uh, in terms of what type of content is eligible for Content ID. So Content ID is intended to work with music content and some types of recordings are not allowed. So for example, karaoke, white noise, spoken word, these generally aren't eligible for Content ID. Um, furthermore, like I mentioned earlier, like you, you must have the exclusive rights to the sound recording um, to add it to Content ID. And like, just for the avoidance of doubt, that means the following content's not eligible. So content which is licensed non-exclusively from a third party, content which is released under any Creative Commons or similar free or open license, um, public domain recordings or compositions, which we'll touch upon in just a second, um, clips or samples from other sources used under fair use principles, and bespoke video game soundtracks, um, these generally aren't eligible. In addition to them, Sound recordings need to be um, what YouTube defines as sufficiently distinct, which means that remasters, sound alike recordings, sound effects and sound beds or production loops generally are not eligible either. So I'd mentioned public domain. Um, under some people watching this might be, you know, you might have a catalogue full of public domain recordings. So if you're playing a public domain composition and you're performing that faithfully, so faithfully to the original, sometimes it's been our experience that YouTube's content ID system actually can't differentiate between your recording of that public domain composition and someone else's recording of the public domain composition. It turns up lots of lots of conflicts. Um, so generally these aren't these aren't eligible, but if you have a public domain composition or you sorry, you're you're you're, you've recorded um, a version of a public domain composition um, and you're not sure whether it would be eligible or not, I would I'd recommend getting in touch with your distributor or whoever manages your content ID before you before you submit it and get their opinion on it. Um, finally, I want to talk about whitelisting. So there's a couple of elements to whitelisting. Uh, one is if you're planning a live stream containing your sound recordings like an album playback so there's limits on the number of recordings that are allowed to appear in a live stream um this is this specific section sort of applies to facebook so like for facebook there's limits on the number of recordings which are allowed to appear in a live stream um, and going over this limit means that the stream can be halted so whitelisting in advance the page that will be broadcast in the live stream means that you'd be allowed um to live stream the pre-selected recordings right there's a similar process for youtube if you're doing this kind of thing um both of them tend to need manual input from your distributor or whoever manages your con copyrights on these services um so i'd recommend just getting in touch with them well in advance of you planning any of these events to ensure that the pages can get whitelisted for that and the second part of uh this is a question which comes up relatively frequently actually people ask is you know well, how do I override my sound recordings default policy for a particular video or channel? So maybe you want to monetize usages of your sound recording on other people's videos, but not your own uploads. Then again, depending on how your distributor manages this process, um, you may have the option to confirm or release every individual claim that comes in. Um, and in that case, then it's quite simple. Basically, all you need to do is just release the videos that you don't want that policy to apply to. Um, or if you have a different monetization policy that you want applied to a particular video, again, my recommendation would be just to get in touch with whoever's managing your copyrights on those platforms and speak to them about it because there's ways to do it manually.